Hello, and up, welcome to the APEX webinar, Reimagining Sustainability in the Supply Chain, with Stephen A. Melnick and Lars Magnuson. My name is Jennifer Storelli, Associate Editor at APEX. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and will be available at apex.org slash online events starting early next week. Before we begin, I'd like to run through a few details. At the end of the presentation, we will save time for a question and answer session. If you look at the right toolbar on your screen, you'll see a questions box. To ask your question at any time during the presentation, simply type it in the box and click send. Should you experience any technical difficulties during today's broadcast, please call GoToWebinar Tech Support at 1-805-617-7000. Again, that's 1-805-617-7000. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Hello, and welcome to this latest webinar jointly sponsored by Michigan State University and APEX. Today we're going to talk about reimagining sustainability in the supply chain beyond the horizon, where we talk about transforming sustainability to meet the requirements of a dynamic world. My name is Stephen A. Melnick, and I'm a professor of operations and supply chain management at Michigan State University. Joining me on this webinar will be Lars Magnuson, Cross Process Director, Logistics Supply Chain, Center of Excellence, Ericsson. What are we going to be trying to do in today's webinar? Well, essentially we're going to focus on three things. The first is, given that this webinar is a direct result of the supply chain management beyond the horizon research initiative, we're going to begin by giving you an overview and by setting the stage. Next, Lars and I will discuss how tr sustainability is transforming itself. It's moving beyond the planet and recognizing that sustainability today is more than just simply pollution control and prevention. It's sustainability of the business. Finally, there should be about 15 minutes left where we will respond to questions that you, the participant, have, has submitted. So, if we're ready, let's begin. At the heart of this webinar is Supply Chain Management Beyond the Horizon. This is an initiative that has been jointly sponsored by Michigan State University, the Broad College of Business, and APEX and the Supply Chain Council. Supply Chain Management Beyond the Horizon is an attempt by Michigan State University and APEX to address a critical question, one that was raised in the March 2015 Harvard Business Review article by Sol, Humpkins, and Sol, where they asked the question, why does strategy execution unravel and what to do about it? In that paper, the authors asked 800 global CEOs, what's the one thing that kept them up at night? The answer was not China, it was not intellectual property, it was not innovation. It was the inability of strategy to bridge the gap between where they are and where they want to be. One way of envisioning this gap is to think of this bridge. On the left-hand side, you have intent, goal. On the right-hand side, you have realization, we've made it. The gap, the chasm, is what Seoul home case and Seoul talked about. We see, a, we see a bridge being built crossing this chasm. On the extreme left is internal and external drivers. Then we have strategy, structure, and practices. However, the next two pillars are ones which have received very little attention in the literature. These are capabilities and competencies. They are critical to crossing the chasm and they are at the heart of Beyond the Horizon. Now that you know the goal of supply chain management beyond the horizon, it's important to understand the three questions which are driving most of our research. They are, how is supply chain management becoming a strategic, not tactical asset? What emerging trends or developments will shape the future of supply chain management? Hence the title, Beyond the Horizon. And why are some firms more successful with strategic supply chain management than others? 
even though they seem to have the same tools, systems, and practices. To address these questions, we have assembled a team of some of the world's foremost researchers in supply chain management, consisting of Dave Close, Vix Cooper, Pat Doherty, Dave Freyer, Stan Griffiths, Nick Little, Steve Melnick, yours truly, Gary Raggetts, and Judy Whipple. These are researchers who are known for their ability to cross the gap between theory and practice. To address the research questions, the research team has drawn on a wide variety of tools, beginning with in-depth interviews with some 50 plus medium and large firms globally located with a focus on manufacturing, retail, service industries. In these interviews, which typically have lasted about two hours per person, we've covered issues such as the environment, both internal and external, functional strategies, supply chain practices, performance measurement, organizational structure, strategic formulations, strategic initiatives, and goals. We have analyzed the results using a mixed bag of tools, including interviews, recordings, coding, and ultimately content analysis, where we've been able to identify key thematic threads within the work. During the process of carrying out these interviews, the research team uncovered a critical question, one which if asked, often generated a lot of insight and a lot of issues. This was a simple question. We asked the participants, what keeps you up at night? In response, we got a lot of input. However, out of this input, six key themes came out. One it was the importance and need for integrated solutions. It was no longer enough to have standalone. Things had to work together. It was the system, not the parts, that was critical talent and leadership. Managers understood that they were in a critical phase where the new supply chain required new leaders and new participants. However, that meant that they had to create it and uncover it. This led to an issue of talent, leader, talent and leadership. Complexity and risk. Increasingly, managers recognized that customers were demanding more. However, complexity, we found out, was not the same thing as complicated. We will explore this in this session. And they also recognized the need to deal with risk, challenges, threats to the supply chain. They, were also, they also discussed threats and challenges, the importance of compliance with the various regulations, local, national, and global, and also cost and purchasing issues. Ultimately, they had to place orders and they had to think about the bottom line. These six formed most of the basis for the results that we're, gonna, that we're talking about now in these presentations. Well, how about today's session? What are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to start by focusing on sustainability, the challenge of transformation. In a recent APEX article, Bixby Cooper and Stan Griffiths talked about sustainability they ended with two major conclusions. The first was that sustainability was becoming increasingly more important. The second, most firms had difficulty achieving it. We're going to build on this theme, but more importantly, we're going to use recent study findings to expand. And what we're going to talk about is that sustainability itself, the concept, is changing, it's transforming. It's transforming from small s sustainability, where the small s refers to planet and pollution, to large s sustainability, where the, s, where the large s refers to our ability to sustain and grow the business. The elements of this large s sustainability are complexity, risk resilience and uncertainty, and ultimately how these factors affect the business model. And the business model is important because it is the key fundamental building block on which sustainability and the strategic supply chain is built. And finally, we're going to discuss some key takeaways for you, the participant. As previously noted, 
sustainability is being seen as being increasingly more important and it's a dimension that frustrates many companies. For most, the focal point of sustainability, especially small as sustainability, is a triple bottom line, consisting of three critical intertwined areas. The first is planet, which focuses on pollution and the need to prevent, reduce, or minimize it. The second is people, a recognition that we influence the people who work with or are impacted by the activities of our company. And the third is profit, and the realization that we cannot achieve the first two elements unless we are profitable. So Steve, let's talk a bit about Ericsson. Uh, we are a Swedish company headquartered in Stockholm, and um, we have been around for a while. It uh, was uh, created in 1876. Um, and has been working with uh, um, building and enhancing uh, the communication networks of the world uh, ever since. Uh, today, uh, we have around 40% of the mobile market uh, uh, share. And if you, so if you look at that into kind of subscribers, that gives us around a billion subscribers that daily are connected to our networks. Our vision, uh, as, as, as we stated today, is that we're building a, what we call a network society uh, where every person and every industry has the possibility to use the full potential of um, the availability of communication globally. When we work with these networks, we are, we are looking at a number of uh, perspectives. Um, first of all, of course, we are working with our customers, and the goal here is, of course, to, to transform to be a leading ICT industry transforming partner. Um, to do this, well, of course, we need to have a good relationship with with um, our shareholders, uh, so that they believe that we are that we are creating value that will give them our give them uh, give us our their, their continued support. Um, but beyond that, of course, we have to work uh, being in a responsible way. So we are we are an integrated part of society, uh, and we also want to make sure that we are driving uh, and enabling society to to use the technology that we are providing. And uh, last but not least, uh, we are our employees that we want that is kind of creating these uh, opportunities for technology leadership, uh, as well as um, uh, making sure that we are providing. Uh, all the equipment, uh, hardware, and software, and services to our customers in a credible way. When we talk about connectivity, now we are uh, seeing a kind of an inc increase of that over time. Now we started off up up uh, in the, the beginning of our uh, the creation of the company to connect places, and that is what you would call the plain old telephone system. Um, then, uh, in, in the around the millennium shift, you saw an, a very big, drastic uh, growth of the mobile connectivity, and um, that has been where we have been have, have had our focus for the for the past years. And now we are kind of heading in back into the next uh, yeah, possibility area here, which is the kind of the connection of devices, uh, where we are looking at uh, everything from from uh, computer to computer, but also uh, gadget to gadget. Uh, equipment to equipment, and here we have high hopes for for the future. But as business grow, we also have to make sure that we are behaving in in a good way when we when we do this. So we are driving programs where we are making sure that we are con conducting business in a responsible way, uh, wherever we are doing the business in the world. Um, on top of this, uh, looking at our own uh, energy consumption. Uh, as well as the uh, environmental and climate impact of the business we do and of the equipment and solutions that we provide to our customers. And last but not least, uh, we are working with the communication for all. Uh, this is now uh, making sure, uh, coming back to our vision, where we are enabling communication in all parts of the world for all, all, all categories of users of our equipment. In reimagining sustainability, the question that has to be asked is why? Well. The major reason is in the process of doing the beyond the horizon research, we uncovered numerous examples of firms which were rethinking sustainability. 
what they offered us was a view that wasn't centered around the planet or pollution, but rather it was broader, more dynamic. And it was a view that was best captured in the following terms. Then this brings up an interesting question. Why the transformation from small s, sustainability, as we most, most of us know it, to this newer, broader concept of sustainability with a capital S? Why this transformation in the concept of sustainability? Well, on one hand, this transformation shouldn't surprise you. Most of the successful concepts we use in business, concepts like TQM and Lean, undergo transformations as people use them and uncover the hidden potentials. The same thing can be said of sustainability. Initially, sustainability, as shown in this diagram, began by focusing on the planet and pollution. The goal? To either reduce or prevent pollution and its impact. Over time, it grew to embrace the triple bottom line, which added to the sustainability previously noted, people and profit. Now it's grown again. It's become broader. It's grown into a concept which recognizes the need of sustainability, not only to support the planet, but to support the firm, both now and more importantly, into the future. In short, we've come to realize that concern about pollution, while important, is no longer enough. More is needed if the firm and ultimately the planet are to survive. This leads to a natural question. What's driving this transformation? Why this transformation now? Why are some of the firms we talked with recasting sustainability into this broader, more encompassing construct? The answer is, we now recognize, as previously noted, that concerns about the planet are not enough. It's necessary for survival. We need to think about or rethink sustainability in terms of supporting growth and reducing risk. Ultimately, it's not simply sustainability of the plant that's important. It's sustainability of the firm. And this new sustainability deals with this concern about supporting the growth of the firm now and to the future. Having understood why sustainability now, the next logical question is, how are we taking the triple bottom line and adding to it? What are the new building blocks we're positioning? Well, there are several new building blocks. The first, complexity. Now, before we go any further, let's be clear. Complexity is what the customer demands of us. This is different from a construct we often hear managers talk about, which is complicated. Complicated is what we do to ourselves. Complicated is when we change processes in response to a short-term crisis. Complicated is when we put a bandage in place to deal with the problem and never clean it up. Complicated is what you get when somebody asks you, what happens next? And you respond, it depends. In addition to compl complexity, we're going to talk about the business model. As we're going to show, the business model is the heart of this new concept of sustainability. And finally, we're going to talk about risk and resilience. And those elements, when put together, define the additional building blocks, and the result of which is a broader, more exciting, more supportive system, which can help firms not only to survive, but grow. So let's begin with complexity. You remember we said at the beginning of this webinar that one of the most important questions we asked in the study was that of, what keeps you up at night? It wasn't surprising that one of the top responses, the one issue mentioned most often by the respondents, was that of complexity. And we talked about before, complexity is not the same thing as complicated. Complicated is what we do to ourselves. Complexity is what the customer demands. 
And so therefore we find ourselves being driven by the customer's requirements that we respond to their needs, not that they fit our system. Under this pers perspective, complexity is not evil, it's good. It's a source of value. However, as we started to dig into the concept of complexity, we became aware of something. Most respondents, most companies, didn't recognize that there was a balance between offering too much complexity and not enough. In essence, we had to think of the hidden costs and impacts of complexity. What really helped to crystallize this concept of the hidden costs of complexity was an interview we had with a very bright, young, articulate manager from one of the participating companies. She sat at the table, and as we talked about complexity, she looked at us and made the observation that what's necessary is a cost of complexity model, similar to that of the cost of quality model, which is familiar to most of you. Well, this intrigued us, so we asked her, what do we mean by what do you mean by the cost of complexity? Well, she started off by pointing out that the, the starting point for the cost of complexity is shown in this diagram is the top understanding what's really wanted and needed. Now, again, this is not simply the same as what's desired, but what outcomes do the, does the customer need to achieve and how does complexity fit into that? Next, we have to design complexity in. That means we have to go into the design product of the product or process and to change it so that it accommodates complexity. Then we have to buy for it. Well, unfortunately, complexity means, in many cases, shorter runs, smaller quantities, higher prices. Then we have to build it. And this means complicating the assembly manufacturing process. But this is not enough. When you build it, there's always a question. Will it work? The example she gave is that there's a power harness in her product. As you introduce or increase complexity, you're adding more products and components, and they draw on the power of this harness. At some point, the harness can't support all of the power requirements, and the system fails. So there's this delicate balance between is it necessary, Does, is the customer willing to pay for it, and can we support it, will it work? Now, up to this point, we focused on complexity within the firm. The next point is then there's complexity and its impact after the product gets into the field. And here the issue is supporting it. This means having enough material, having complex builds of material, having support staff, and in, in essence ensuring that the customer is able to use their product both now and over time. A task which is complicated by the presence of complexity. And the point of this diagram is very simple. You have to balance the costs of, of selling or providing complexity against the costs of making or introducing complexity. And at some points, the, co the hidden costs may outweigh the obvious benefits. So let's talk about a bit about Ericsson products and uh, uh, the complexity that, that this, this uh, leads to. And today what we, what we are uh, focusing on is of course the mobile network. And the mobile network uh, to many of, uh, of you is, is an invisible thing. You know that it works when you flick on, flick on your phone. And the equipment that operates a mobile network you can see on the left here. And uh, the visible signs of that we have a mobile network in place is, of course, uh, you can find you know, the things that we usually find out on the out, on our, in our outdoor sites. Uh, just lift your eyes and look at the next building next to you, and you probably will see some masts. And most likely, uh, there is going to be uh, radio communication equipment there. But for the Internet of Things and the connect, connected world, we also need to move into the computer centers of uh, of our customers. And that this is where we are heading now, as well as uh, work, working with uh, a lot of other applications of this.
So what can you do with all of these things that we looked upon in the previous slide? Well, this is the foundation for the network society. You're connecting both people and things to do a lot of exciting things. Um, you can connect vehicles, so you can connect uh, ship lines or containers to make sure that you know the status of what, what they are doing as well as where they are. Uh, you can do uh, various types of uh, measurements uh, or data collection through metering systems of all kinds, from electricity to water. Um, and the kind of said the, a new one hot area here is uh, to be able to support remote surgery and medical medical support. In other words, the doctor don't have to be where you are. Uh, you can remotely do things together with uh, with with, with an, 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 a physician that can be thousands of miles away from you. To manage the delivery of this network society, we have a supply structure at Ericsson. We consist of around 14,000 employees that is uh, uh, supporting this uh, globally. Um, and when I say globally, uh, understanding that we are doing business in 180 countries, of which we have our own staff in around 50. Um, we have uh, our own production sites, plus uh, massive support from our EMS partners. And we are shipping a lot of volume. And you can see the figure here, you know, around uh, one radio unit every 15 seconds, uh, day and night. Uh, and that, for us, uh, is uh, keeping us uh, keeping us busy. But you can also see here that by be, by having the, the uh, mixture of products, as I showed in the previous slide, the mixture of countries uh, and customers in in many many partner part, parts of the world, uh, we have um, an, an uh, interesting challenge when managing the supply chain. The second component of this new sustainability is that of risk and resilience. Let's begin with an interesting observation. Risk and resilience are not new concepts. They're not new to beyond the horizon. For example, we've now recognized that this is a well-established component and issue to the participants in the study. Why? Well, past research has shown that risk and resilience do matter. For example, in a study done in the, in the mid-2000s, two researchers tried to ask the question, what's the impact of a supply chain disruption? What they found was that when a supply chain disruption takes place, stock price drops, on average, 40%. It takes then two years for the stock price to recover. And the more important issue is that many firms have experienced some form of disruption. So these factors have made risk and resilience far more important, not only to the supply chain manager, but to the overall management of the firm. And finally, one other factor that's complicating the issue of risk and resilience is the increasing use of lean, both internally and within the supply chain. What lean does by taking away buffers in the, way of safe, in the form of safety inventory, or stock, safety lead time, or safety capacity, is if taken to extremes, it creates a system that's not simply lean, but fragile. And what do we mean by fragile? Any shock to the system has an immediate and adverse impact on performance. Underlying this interest in risk and resilience is a recognize, recognition that there's a change in how we view risk and resilience. This was very evident in some of the participants that we talked with. If you look at the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see the old views. The old view thought of risk and resilience in terms of financial and operational impact. Does it affect the profit? Does it affect the cost? Does it affect our ability and to get quality parts? And does it affect the timing of these deliveries? And we focused on issues such as the environment, that is earthquakes, fires, tsunamis, floods, on political and social issues such as strikes, or terrorism in fact, financial issues such as corporate bankruptcy, and capacity issues such as the lack of capacity. Well, we found that, that those issues are still there. However, to them we've added a new set of considerations mainly 
for strategic, adjacency, end of life, and malicious. Now let's explore each one in more detail. The first is strategic risk. Well, what do we mean by strategic risk? Simply defined, it's any risk or action taken by a supplier that affects our ability to compete and implement strategic objectives. It consists of three types of actions. The first is hostage taking. What is that? That's where a supplier who recognizes they have a unique position in the marketplace, for example, they could be a bottleneck, uses that position to extract higher costs from, our, from us. They use it to charge a higher price because they know how important we are to them. It also consists of usurpation. What does that mean? That's a situation where you, as a good company, introduce your supplier to your customer. Your supplier rec recognizes that there's a great opportunity to improve their position by cutting you out. Academically, we call that disintermediation of the supply chain. Essentially, they've taken you out of the game. And finally, there's strategic downgrading. This is kind of interesting, and there's a reason we use the Three Stooges here. Strategic downgrading occurs when you get the best team of people from your supplier who come in and we base our business on our interactions with the A team. Well, as soon as they leave and we've given them the contract, who walks in the door? Their replacements. And unfortunately, we no longer have the A team. We've got the three stooges. And consequently, their actions adversely affect us. The second form of risk is that of adjacency risk. What do we mean by that? Well, adjacency risk refers to a situation where an action taking place in a related supply chain affects us directly. Up to this point, all of our interest has been in our own supply chain. Now what we recognize with adjacency risks is that, is that actions taking place elsewhere really do affect us. An example involves a small company we interviewed in mid-Michigan. They use silica to create molds for aluminum. Now, in the past, they had a fairly good relationship with their suppliers. They could predict without any fear of contradiction or risk that they could get product delivery within two weeks. That is true until 2014. Well, do you remember what happened in 2014? in uh, Lake Magenta, where what happened, there was a rail, rail disaster. This rail disaster killed 14 people, but more importantly, it brought attention of the railway industry to the fact that many of the rail cars that were being used to transport dangerous fluids were not lined. The result was that most of the people who own these rail cars decided that what was important is for them to start to buy silicate so they could line their railway cars. The same silicate that was used by this small company. Well, what happened was in almost overnight, the lead time that previously had been two weeks with high certainty became six months with high uncertainty. Ultimately, this small company was able to survive by going to its suppliers and making a very good argument in the form that the demand that they were currently experiencing was short-term. After all, the railway cars had been lined, that demand would go away. They, however, their company would still be in business. So all they were asking for was simply the right of first refusal. Give us the right to accept or refuse an order and then if we refuse it, you can use it for demand. They were able to convince the companies, their suppliers, to play with them. The third form of risk is end-of-life risk. End-of-life risk occurs when we have extended life risks, or that is, when a product is used beyond its planned life. A good example of this is the A10-2 Warthog. The Warthog was designed in the mid-1970s, and it was expected to terminate its life in the mid-1990s. Unfortunately, thanks to the First and Second Gulf Wars and even today's war on ISIS, we've come to an important realization. 
the A-10 to Warthog or the Lightning is still a highly effective, highly efficient, and the most appropriate method of dealing with certain types of missions. Consequently, we're using the product well beyond when it was intended to be used. So what are the challenges when this end-of-life risk occurs? To understand this risk, one way of thinking about it is to look at the traditional bathtub curve, as you see here. This is a curve that's familiar to almost anyone who's worked in quality. What the bathtub curve shows people is that risk of failure is highest at the beginning or towards the end of the life of the product. Well, in the case of extended life risk, we are now encountering the extreme right of the curve. Well, the problem in many cases is that the suppliers are, who built the product may no longer be present. We may not have the infrastructure. We may not have the components. We may not have the jigs and fixtures necessary to maintain the product. Consequently, the firm is faced by a new set of risks, a new set of costs, a new set of challenges. These are challenges not previously encountered. The fourth and final type of risk is that of malicious risk. And this is a new type of risk which is born of the internet and the increasing pressure for firms to reduce price and cost. What do we mean by malicious risk? Well, simply put, malicious risk occurs when others act to purposely and adversely affect your firm's performance. And they do it in one of two ways. The first, they sell you counterfeit products. They sell you something which has a known name but in fact has not been provided by that company. Or alternatively, they try to hack into your system because they know that the supply chain has lots of information that is sensitive, important, and useful. And if they can get access to it, they can generate a competitive advantage. To give you a better idea of the threats posed by cybersecurity, I want to share with you results of a report that I recently received from a British intelligence organization. In this report, they began by pointing out that they asked a simple question, what percentage of organizations have experienced a security breach? The answer, well, 93% of large organizations had. 87% of small organizations had. But here's the statistic that was most interesting. This number, which for the survey, which was carried out in 2013, represented a 50% increase in breaches from the prior year. In other words, this threat is increasing at an exponential rate, and it's a threat that affects any firm that has a global or decentralized supply chain. When we look at risk management, for Ericsson, I want to tie this back into the R1 position, as we talked about earlier. Um, so when we, when, when, when uh, uh, focusing on risk, you know, we try to make sure that we are uh, managing the perception and the credibility of, of, the, of our company in, in, in a good way, uh, so that we are a trustworthy partner to our customers. Uh, we, would, we want to secure the financial value add to our shareholders, that we can continue to do business coming back to the uh, triple bottom line as Steve talked about in the beginning. And of course, uh, we want to make sure that we are doing business in a responsible way. Uh, our motto here is technology for good, which is uh, perhaps I uh, can see as a contrast to what Steve talked about before here on the malicious things that you can do with, with, the, with the internet. Um, and uh, finally, we are looking at the secure and safety of our staff and availability of competence to manage uh, the risks that we that may may occur in the complex supply chain that you saw in the, in, in in a very earlier slide here. Risk resilience and complexity are inputs, and they affect the third building block to the new sustainability. And what's the third building block? This is the business model. What do we mean by the business model? Well, let's first of all understand by looking at it. The business model brings together three critical elements. It brings together the key customer. It brings together the value proposition. And it, bring to, it brings together capabilities. Now, let's understand what we're doing here. 
The business model is an operational implementation of strategy. It seeks to ensure that there's alignment between these three key elements, or stated alternatively, it seeks to ensure that what the key customer expects, what we have promised, and what we can do are aligned. When those three components are aligned, we have competitive advantage and we have value. However, the business model is not static. What works in one time period may not work in another. And firms are now recognizing the need to carry out a review of their business model on a regular basis because of changes in the key customer, the value proposition and capabilities. And these changes can come internally from the key customer, for example. They can come because the value proposition has now become viewed as a given, or they can ch occur because of changes in technology. In order to understand the need to review the sustainability of the current business model and the need to change it, consider the experiences of a recent icon of American industry which went bankrupt. That icon, Radio Shack. Prior to the 1980s, Radio Shack had a very interesting key customer. They had hobbyists. And what did Radio Shack provide them? With all the supplies and knowledge needed for them to build ham radios and the such. They were the place you went to for a solution if you're going to build a ham radio. Then in the 1980s, what happened? Well, what happened was we had a transition. In walked in the computer, and suddenly Radio Shack became the first place that you could go to buy a computer. In fact, it had its own computer, the TRS-80. The problem with the problem with this approach is that over time, Radio Shack failed to understand that their key customer had changed. It was no longer the hobbyist; it was the person who wanted to buy a computer. It also recognized that its value proposition was no longer valid. It wasn't enough to be able to go to a place where you could buy a computer. What you now had to have is support and peripherals. You had to have inventory. You had to have delivery. The problem also was that its capabilities were no longer acceptable. Unlike some of its competitors like Amazon, which was an online competitor, or Best Buy, which was a brick-and-mortar competitor, and typically these competitors were big and offered a wide variety of product, Radio Shack was rather different. What Radio Shack offered its customers were small stores located in strip malls with crammed inventory, eclectic, and somewhat strange selection of inventory, and often not the products that they wanted. Consequently, over time, Radio Shack experienced a loss of sales, and that loss of sales and loss of profit was a reflection of the fact that its business model was no longer sustainable. By the time Radio Shack realized it, it was too late, and it had gone out of business. An icon was no longer there. As you can see from the type of business that we are doing, uh, we are having various types of changes of business models over time. So when we come to the value proposition part, well, we are going from connecting places to connecting devices, which of course means that we are changing not, not only our cust the, the customer base, but also the supplier base and the technology that we need to apply for, for, for that business. Um, when it comes from in, in, in looking at the key customers, uh, well, in the past, uh, used to be a fixed, mo fixed uh, network telecom monopoly, uh, moving into a fast, fast movers in the ICT industry. Uh, which, of course, uh, gives both opportunities and challenges. And um, uh, in, in, at, at the top of this, you know, we used to be a hardware delivery company producing equipment, um, all of it ourselves, supplying to our customers. And um, now, and as we move into the, uh, the connected world of network society, well, it's an integration of hardware, software, and service delivery. And um, uh, the last part is, of course, of the utmost importance for us uh, as uh, to make sure that we are kind of moving in, into the value chain of our customers. We now come to the end of this webinar. 
and we offer for you three major takeaways. What are they? The first is obvious. Sustainability is important. It's important now, and it is important into the future. But more importantly, it is changing. Sustainability is morphing. The second point, from a focus on the planet and pollution to one that recognizes we've got to folk, we've got to develop sustainability for growth. We've got to develop a system that can enable the firm to profit now and into the future. And it is these profits which enable sustainability with an emphasis on the planet to succeed. And finally, it's a broader definition. It's a definition which includes the business model, which has expanded its view of risk and resilience, which recognizes that complexity is not going to go away. Complexity is going to be there because it is demanded by our customer. It is different from complicated, and it is something in which the costs have to be managed and assessed. All of these lead to the need for a new generation of leadership and talent. That is why the final point is one of talent leadership. Well, how do we summarize what we're trying to say about this new sustainability? This new sustainability, which is focusing not on simply the planet, but ensuring the survival and growth of the firm. We've given you a number of things to think about today, and some of you are probably asking, why do I have to listen to this? Well, that's similar to a question that W. Edward Deming, the man in front of you, was faced by. He had given a presentation on TQM in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he laid out some of the 17 conditions that firms had to undertake if they were to survive and grow. After the presentation, he was approached by a CEO and the board of a fairly large multinational firm. The CEO went up to Deming, shook his hand, thanked him for the presentation, and then said, surely, Dr. Deming, we don't have to do all of this. As if to ask, you know, this is not all equally important. At which point, Dr. Deming, after recovering from the shock of having heard such an interesting statement, looked at the man and then simply said, no, you don't have to do these things. Survival, after all, is not mandatory. You don't have to do all these things or think about them because sustainability, survival and growth is, after all, not mandatory. This I'm going to cut you off right there, Steve. Thanks so much, Steve and Lars, for your great presentation. And now we've saved some time for questions and answers. As a reminder, please type your question in the questions box on the toolbar. I'll give you now a few moments to send in your questions. All right, our first question I think I'm going to pass over to Lars. Lars, what would you say are the major differences in perspective um, regarding sustainability between North America and Europe? Well, that is an uh, interesting question. Um, from, uh, and uh, I, uh, I've just heard there was uh, some jokes about uh, the US president candidates in the US being the president of Sweden. Uh, we have some. Uh, we have a bit of more controlled, uh, controlled environment uh, laws uh, than I would say that you have in the U.S. But on the other hand, you have a tremendous legal volume in what you do. Uh, so when even, even the smallest change in the in, in the mass, massive uh, area like the U.S. has a very big impact, similar as you would see, for example, in China and India. Um, so there are differences, uh, but at the end, uh, it's still the same planet and the marketplace that we are living in is very, very global, as you say, and as you saw, saw from our presentation here, working in many, many different directions of the world. Uh, so we have to keep it together in some way, shape or form, otherwise uh, we, there are lots of things that we can lose if we don't manage that. Excellent, thank you. And so uh, my next question, I'll pass it over to Steve. How would you quantify sustainability? Uh, 
it, it sounds like Steve's having some audio problems. Lars, do you want to take over on this one? Well, the quantification here, and coming back to the different perspectives, uh, of course, then to, to, to measure, uh, to, to go in into kind of the effect on, on nature, which is now uh, very, as you can see from the UN panelists that are trying to measure, this is very, very hard, but at the same time, uh, very, at the same time necessary to do. When it comes to the other perspectives, you know, if it's uh, having a kind of sustainability when it comes to, to the way you work in a society, now, are you a, a truly a, a kind of a world citizen part part of the societies where you do business and where you do where, where you are kind of uh, impacting and util, utilizing the resources available? Uh, that is fairly that is fairly easy to follow, uh, as well as the kind of your image from a brand, brand value perspective, which for us uh, is very very important. Sounds good. And then we have a question from Harry. How do you see Internet of Things benefiting companies that rely heavily on manufacturing? Lars, do you want to take that one as well? Well, manufacturing, you know, pretty much uh, everything we do, and if you take on your score hat, is we have a make process. Uh, so you're producing and kind of doing value add on, on hardware, but just as you are producing services uh, and software. Uh, so, from from this perspective, you know, you have the, the kind of the, you have different types of impact depending on what what type of make process you're in, um, and of course, it becomes more spectacular if you have a big uh, chimney and you have uh, things small coming coming out on top of that. Uh, but we shouldn't underestimate the things that you do. You know, if you take an, a software company like uh, like, like uh, running a computer center. You know, the amount of uh, energy that can be wasted if you do things wrong uh, and just kind of uh, heat, the, heat uh, the birds on top of the roof with, with uh, all, all the um, extra energy that you kind of cool out of, the, of the, your computer center uh, is, of course, not efficient at all. So uh, it depends that you have this type of possibility to waste things in all types of environments. And um, uh, what we hope for is that you know, everybody is making sure that you know, we are utilizing uh, all types of resources in a smart way. Very good. And now we have a question from Giacomo. How can companies combine sustainability with profitability? Lars, can you take that one too? Yeah, okay. Okay. Have a look, Steve. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, um, okay. It's, I would say that uh, one without the other is, is uh, very, very hard to do. Um, the sus sustainability, you know, uh, as long as when you, do, when you work with sustainability, and I can take an example here when we look, for example, the, uh, the movement of uh, kind of CO2 uh, uh, level that we get from our own transportation. Now, in the past, you know, we were a big air freight company. Uh, we were kind of freighting a lot of your, our goods by air freight. Now we have seen in the last five or six years gone to surface transport so that we actually are uh, up to, I think it's 80% of our transport is uh, actually done by truck or by sea. Um, and that means that um, uh, for us that uh, has meant that we, have, we are freeing up a lot of money because at the same time as we are kind of giving a big environmental impact, uh, we are also saving a significant amount of money that we can use as investment for other things that we need to do in the company, both for our own profitability, but as well for other uh, and, uh, sustainability investments. Great. Thank you, Lars. Steve, I see you're back online, so I have a couple questions for you now. Sure. So Dean asks, what is the link between the UN's Agenda 21 and the sustainability you talk about? He says his understanding was that capitalism is not compatible with sustainability because profits are the focus. So what's your take on that? Uh, that's a good question. And the reason I think it's a very good, first of all, thanks, Dean, for asking a really neat question. Uh, you have to understand something about Agenda 21. It was first formulated in, the 19, in 1997 or 1992, I think. At that point, like, for example, the EPA, there was a notion that we were living in an or society. You either are sustainable or you're profitable. Increasingly, we're starting to see in organizations and in NGOs and government and in organizations like the United Nations an awareness that the two are not opponents, they're really complementary. That is, 
in order to be sustainable, the firm has to have a business case. It has to make a profit. And if you can't make a profit, then you can't make the investments necessary to change processes, to make things different, in order to improve things so that essentially the goals of Agenda 21 are satisfied. And I think what you're also picking up, too, is the fact that this is, you know, both business and, go and organizations like the United Nations are really rethinking their position. Finally, to give you an idea, when I was speaking in Australia last year, I had a chance to speak to someone from the United Nations who was in Australia, and they were talking about the same thing. They, want, they see this increasingly as becoming a partnership, not a competition. Very good. Thanks, Steve. Lars, we had another question come in for you. Uh, with growing short product life cycle, how, sustainable supply chain, how can sustainable supply chain impact profitability? Sorry, do you want me to repeat that? I apologize. Um, it looks like the question's asking, because um, product life cycles can be getting shorter, how does sustainable supply chain impact profitability? Lars, are you still there? Doesn't look like it. Of course. Yes. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, I'm back. Sorry. Okay. Uh, well, of, of course, no, as, as uh, when, she meant, when she, life cycles get shorter and shorter, no, of course, you, you will have to uh, already in, in your kind of product management and design, design phases of, of your product, of, of your uh, company's um, activities, design, you go to uh, design for sustainability. Uh, so that uh, ma making sure that you can do uh, swaps, that you have a modular approach. So when when some when you swap the kind of the base frame or the kind of the ba the, the backbone of what you do can be used in multiple generations of product, but perhaps not be without being visible for the surrounding world in in, in a very in a very significant way. So it's I would say kind of uh, to the design for sustainability is, is a big thing here. Can I add to that? Uh, because I've also noticed something else that this is doing. And what Lars is getting to is that in the past, when we looked at sustainability, we tended to think of it as an afterthought. Because product life cycles are shorter, what we're now starting to do is we're starting to involve it earlier on in the design process. Just like we've realized that if we're going to be successful in introducing new products faster to the marketplace, we've got to get purchasing, we've got to get manufacturing, engineering more earlier involved earlier in the process. We've also got to do sustainability. Because if you think about these issues and you think about them early, they don't. The impact in terms of cost is not as big. Remember the Phillips rule, which is one of the rules we use when we teach sustainability at state. And it came out of Phillips Petroleum. It says a design in a change in design that costs you a dollar, co that same change when you're in prototype costs you ten dollars, and when you get to production, it can cost you anywhere from a thousand, from a hundred to a thousand dollars. So if you want to do sustainability, move it, move it into the system earlier. Sounds good. Well, thank you both for those answers. And I think we have time for one more question. And Steve M says one your way since you're our academic. Chris thank asks, you. how can up and coming supply chain professionals best prepare for sustainability challenges in their careers? Like, do you recommend any classes or certifications? What's your take? Uh, okay, that's a, that's, Chris, that's another good question. Uh, the first thing I'm going to tell you right now is if you go, if you take most of the APEX certification courses, you've really got a foundation. Uh, one of the things I would recommend is start thinking about process orientations early. Number two, read. Uh, there's a number of good journals out there. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at things like, you know, Supply Chain Management Review does a good job of discussing sustainability. Uh, last year, I was talking with uh, Bob Tribblecock, and he had a special issue on this. Uh, take a look at some of the web pages. Out, take a look at some of the resources on the internet. Finally, many universities offer courses in sustainability in the supply chain. Uh, we do at State. Uh, one of my colleagues, Robert Schroff, has a master's in sustainable supply chain that he offers through Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. There's a lot of resources out there. And finally, if you want a good reference, I'm going to tell you to look at a book written by Srof and Melnick called Developing Sustainable Supply Chains, which was recently recognized as, as being a top 30 book in this area. This is referred to as a shameless plug. <laughs> well, great plug, Steve. So that's all the questions we have time for today. 
If your question was not answered or you have additional questions, you can reach out to the speakers at the information on the screen. And now I'd like to thank our speakers for their time today and all of you for attending this APEX webinar. All content and materials included in this edition of the APEX webinar are the property of APEX and Michigan State University and are protected by the United States and international copyright laws. All rights are reserved. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.